Welcome back to the pursuit of ownership. Whoa, am I on the wrong show? Oh, I think this is the right show. I'm I'm hijacking today. No, you're definitely on the wrong show. No, this is not the wrong show. This is the right show. This is the pursuit of ownership, and I'm here with Tyler Tolbert. It's good to be back um, on my own show and and to be trying to take the reins again. Um, you know, I I'm always happy to to have George on, uh, and he's happy to uh, you know uh, host my show and, and, and take the reins. So I guess it's a mutually beneficial relationship we have going on. So, well, I actually think you're hosting this episode, technically speaking, Okay, um, that's fair. but you know, let me, let me just quickly kind of outline for our listeners what, what's going on today. So as you can probably imagine, I get a lot of emails and, you know, Facebook messages. I think I consider them both about the same. And what I had to start doing because I've gotten so many is, you know, instead of, you know, you might get four, five, six emails a day with a lot of questions, you know, each one might take 30 minutes to respond to, you know, if I want to respond properly. So we started doing instead is compiling questions that I get via email and letting people know that, hey, I'm not ignoring your questions. We're writing them all down and we're going to answer them on the show for everybody to hear in these question and answer segments. And so we're going to do them on the pursuit of ownership when they relate to pre-ownership. And we're going to do them on practice underwater when they relate to practice ownership. And so Matt and I will do those on Prax Underwater um, to interrupt our regularly scheduled programming. So that's sort of the, uh, and then Tyler has the questions and he's going to go through them and we're just going to have a good discussion and answer people's questions. And then if you maybe had that question, but didn't send an email for whatever reason, you also benefit as well. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a uh, quite a litany of questions here that I haven't totally been through yet, but how many are we talking? You know, because I, I I don't even look at these. Like I, I I'm not I'm coming with nothing other than I just I had my personal assistant email Tyler all the questions, and that that's that's where I'm at. So I yeah. got nothing. You know, I I did not do the chore of actually going through and counting them, but I saw enough for an episode, and I said, well, let's just go for it. No, <laughs> can actually count them. So, um, I'll probably just uh, rail off on a few that that seem interesting right off the bat. Um. Okay, so this this is pretty good. Um, so th- this one is: What steps would you take while in school to prepare for ownership? What specifically would you do? Um, well, that's the question. But what I get from it is knowing what you know now, because you obviously did a lot in school to prepare. Um, but obviously, when you actually you know go out into battle and and you find new problems that you perhaps didn't anticipate, you may have thought mm, maybe I should have spent my time a little bit differently. So looking back, how how differently would would you have spent that time and what would you invest it more in? So I guess the question is answered two different ways because it's, are you, is this early ownership or is this, is this no associateship? Is this early ownership at what, you know, I feel like every, if, based mm-hmm. on when you're planning on entering ownership, I think you should be doing different things in dental school. That's true. Yeah. It's very specific to your goals. Well, okay. Uh, so I'm assuming that this person um, is super ambitious and is looking to own uh, very soon out of school, if not immediately. Um, so they're definitely trying to prime themselves for business ownership as quickly as possible. Um, but they also po- probably want to be clinically competent when they get out as well. So we'll okay, from there, yeah. So I think there's facets. I think there is the understanding yourself well enough to know your type of practice that you want to own. Yeah. And then I think there is development on the side of leadership and being able to kind of stand in and handle a lot of ownership and then clinical and, you know, probably also some practice management stuff. So probably four different areas. So I'll kind of talk about them one by one. Okay. The first being, you know, let's talk about clinical. Obviously I think it's, this goes without saying the bread and butter dentistry, like fillings, crowns, that stuff should be pretty automatic before you walk into practice ownership. Like you shouldn't be worried about a crown prep as a practice owner, um, that should just come. Uh, I think the areas where you really want to push is endo and extractions. And I would do them in the order of extractions than endo personally. If you're working somewhere with a higher carries risk, then endo, then extractions, because obviously endo is a higher dollar. You're adding a crown to it. You know, being able to that financially is typically a little bit better than doing extractions. Um, but I would I would think that those two I put them hand in hand as really the first two specialty procedures that mm-hmm. you should be comfortable with, and whether that's school or an associateship, I would explore associateships that give me the opportunity to do endo in high carries risk areas. 
So uh, I'm curious as far as Endo is concerned, do you approach it as um, someone should sort of open up their repertoire and be able to do, you know, more posterior endo predictably, or the, should they just sort of double down on their anterior endo and just get really good and fast and efficient at it? Like how should they maybe approach that? People who say they don't do endo usually still do anterior endo. Okay. That's typically That's what I found. I mean, I do anterior endo. Yeah. So I, I would think that, and honestly, you kind of, you kind of alluded to this idea that you should do as much endo as you can in school, even if you don't feel like you would ever do it in practice because you need to learn. It's funny, when I went to Implant Pathways, we were doing a couple implants that I was like, you know what, <laughs> this is a little sketchy. I, I probably wouldn't do this, you know, outside of this course. Sure. And I was explaining that to Dr. Moody and he was like, well, that's the purpose of you being at this course. Right. Is yeah. knowing that boundary and getting there and realizing, ooh, I wouldn't do this again. And right, it's either two things. It's either I wouldn't do this again because it probably isn't a good idea or I, it, I'm not going to do this again until I've done more of these and it becomes more comfortable. And so right. I would try to reach that same point in both of those areas, endo and extraction. Do an endo that's so hard. Like I, I one time in dental school did uh, endo through a crown on like this, it was a really long tooth. And anyway, I was like, yeah, that's that's the end of my, that's I'm not doing that again. <laughs> you know, it clinically came out okay, but like it was so difficult. Uh, yeah. Just the access alone, where I was like, no desire to do that again. And reaching yeah. that point, or, you know, like an extraction that was like, that was way too much work to take out that tooth, but now I know. And being able to reach that point where you have a good feel for where that boundary is for your clinical skill set and trying to stretch it a little bit, but, you know, stretch it as in grow that area, right? Get the reps mm -hmm. in there where the things that, shouldn't feel uncomfortable don't but then the things that should feel uncomfortable and you should refer you know you probably are going to refer and so i think it's uh pushing that boundary and understanding where that boundary is is just as important as actually being able to complete the procedure itself yeah no i, I think you have to sort of explore your limits to know where they are naturally so you have to push them and would you rather do that in a, in a school environment or in your own practice with your own patients on a very much tighter time schedule and you know where, where there's a lot more liability involved right so well the thing people don't realize is when you walk into your own practice those are your patients for the next 20 plus years typically so the last thing i want to be doing is experimenting you know and like yeah. i'm not sure if i could do this but let me just like do this on this person that i'm going to have this long-term relationship with so whether it be dental school or to a lesser extent associateship those are still two areas where they're more transient you'll have some geographic success with all of your work and I would, I would venture, I would become, I would be the most aggressive in dental school. And then I would be a little bit more aggressive than I would be in ownership and an associateship. And then in, a, in ownership, I would kind of be my established sustainable self. Okay. So um, that's sort of how I would do it clinically. Yeah. Um, are there any CE courses that you're aware of that um, someone could look into for, for endo? Because, I mean, we're talking about getting into cases while in school. Sometimes that's hard to do. Like, I, I can extract tell you. Extract the teeth. Yeah, oh, extract. Okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, I feel like every endo CE, like, there's very rarely is like a patient in pain who's of like course. been prepared yeah. for this course. You know, it's it's always extracted teeth. So, yeah, okay. I would do a lot of accesses on extracted teeth. And, you know, typically those yeah, perio, yeah. you know, denture places have great perio teeth that's that true. aren't bombed out. So, um, that's probably what I would do. But, you know, I just think that's that might need an associateship. If you're really committed yeah. to getting good at endo, that might be going to an associateship somewhere that takes, you know, Medicaid or something where there's high carries risk, adult Medicaid, probably a lot of endo. And, you know, you just get good at endo. And that's the purpose of that associateship in your life. I mean, honestly, I'd do anything to avoid having another jar of extracted teeth in my locker. So <laughs> <laughs> that means taking a job. Yeah, I think I think we'll have to go for that. I'm not, I'm not going through it again. No way. You don't like the smell? Oh, good God. Yeah. I mean, I, I thought it was bad when my class went through. And then I, I, I'm convinced that the classes that came after us just just put just straight water in those jars, like no oh. no bleach or anything. Gross. And uh, I mean, we had to clear out. And it was like people evacuated the practice lab. Oh. Uh, it was a mess. And, uh, you know, that, that never really leaves you, you know. That's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> that, yeah. You know, the, the look on my face right brain. now is not not yeah, one of it, it's of, precious <laughs> yeah appet, it's not appetizing at all oh geez yeah all right well i'm gonna move on to the uh 
<laughs> the right. idea of leadership let's, development. Let's. And I think the, you know, the one thing about practice ownership that surprised me is how much, I guess, the mental health component, if I want to call it that, mm. is important. The ability to, how much mental health impacts practice owners. So things not going your way, you know, I think if we can guarantee one thing for sure about practice ownership is that things won't go your way, things will surprise you, and probably anything in life you could say that. And so being able to be prepared for it and being able to, I guess, have the the resolve and the strength and knowing yourself to be able to stick with decisions that might not look like they're going to be a good idea, but kind of having the the fear, you know, the fearlessness to kind of stay with it. It's kind of hard to describe, but that like that grit, I just yeah. think that's an important component that isn't talked about is the ability to, and I'm not trying to sound all extreme ownership on everybody, but it it just, it's, it's just that, yeah, just the ability to withstand when things don't go your way. I just yeah. think that's in general a really great skill to have as a practice owner. And when you're not, it, it makes it very difficult to stay level-headed when, you know, there are days, Ike, uh, one of my really good friends has, we always have this expression where it's like some days you're the hammer, other days you're the nail. And right. I think, you know, you go through practice ownership and some days are just like the best. It's like, mm. man, I can't believe this is real life. This is my real life. And other days you're also saying, I can't believe this is my real life because like just nothing went well. Yeah. And being able to stay level-headed throughout both days and not getting too high and not getting too low is I think an invaluable skill, especially early career practice ownership. So do you think that that's a result of you becoming, um, you know, harder, like someone that can just roll with the punches or do you think perhaps you've become more aloof about failure and um, stress? Cause I, personally, I feel like I've, I've grown a little bit since being in school, just from, you know, being under a lot of high pressure situations where I'm, you know, I have to perform well or fail. And there's just a million things I could be stressed about if I were looking for that. And one way that I've kind of adapted to it is not necessarily by becoming, you know, more disciplined or hardcore or anything, but actually just sort of keeping things big picture, trying to stay level-headed, even keel. For me, it's it's actually been a little bit more of a process of just sort of letting go and and just trusting the process for me. Like, how, how do you think, you know, you've adapted to, to things? I love like that. that last thing you said, you know, trust the process, not the yeah. result. Yeah, and exactly. Yeah. I think that's, so for me, it's a lot of, I think a lot of times when you really, you know, and this is like coaching client conversations you have with owners where you look at it and a lot of times stuff that's going on in their practice is is bothering them not because of the stuff going on in their practice it's more what it says about them or an insecurity they have or a fear that they have and the more you can address your own shit and really understand yourself and have you know i think for me the calmness and the easy feeling came mm. from being very secure in myself oh. and you know it's this idea that if like right now we're in the middle of COVID, my practice is closed, you know, like it, it could potentially be a very chaotic time, but I feel very confident in myself, my practice, my abilities. And I'm not, you, you know, you, you have that security. And so I think being very stable in yourself makes it so that things externally can't rock you. And so I think keeping that sort of internal stability and that internal I guess the majority of the things you need come from you. That way you're no longer, you're not dependent on your practice to kind of give you anything. It's very weird that I say that. And I guess it's something I, when, when you talk to practice owners, we're kind of all like, yeah, you know, I go really up with the practice and I go down. That's a very common thing you'll hear, you know, not nobody's saying that on air, but that's what we talk about kind of yeah. behind the scenes. And when you, I think I, I sort of reached this point in my practice where like we were having our best month ever and it wasn't as exciting to me as it normally would have been because it doesn't, it didn't like tell me anything about myself that it didn't like give me any sort of positive validation. I was like, Oh, this is interesting. We're having a really great month. Let me see what next month looks like to see if it's sustainable. That's kind of what, that was really the level of excitement I had. And it, it's just interesting when you can, when you can remove yourself from the result and you just kind of go through a process, you trust it, and you look at failure not as a reflection of you. Like I, something failed in my practice, not because George sucks. It's just because George is figuring it out and we just have to look at it objectively and right. sort of pivot. And your ability to do that in things in your life, like with patience, right? How can you build that skill not as a practice owner? So with patience, when something doesn't go well, it's not your fault. I mean, maybe it might be. 
but it's either a growing edge or it's just mm-hmm. an unfortunate circumstance. And so it's either an area that, you know, Tyler, you have an opportunity to grow in this area and this opportunity taught you that you're still awesome. You're still a great guy. It just was something you learned or it was, you know, just, Hey, look, the implant didn't take, like you placed it in a great position. That's biology. Sometimes just happens, move on, you know, it, your ability to do that and to look at, you know, challenges in your life and not have them negatively reflect on you will ultimately give you that type of stability that I think is very important to make sound decisions as an owner. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's perfect. I mean, just, just not allowing your internal self-concept to be determined by external circumstances. Yes. Those are always going to be fluctuating and you don't want to be, you know, going along with the ebb and flow of that. You have to kind of have that consistent, you know, self-confidence. So I think that's, that's invaluable. Yeah, that's good. And then um, I think on that next token of practice management stuff, I think the business master seminar at Breakaway, Practice Underwater, and the the stuff we talk about on the show, you know, selecting practices, you know, obviously I think this conversation would be missing if we didn't talk about group practice versus solo, having an idea of which way you want it to go. I think that's almost a prerequisite for ownership nowadays, especially I'm so happy that we're bringing this conversation to light when it hasn't been done before, because you can't walk into a practice without knowing your long-term vision. So having a very clear long-term vision for what you want your ownership to look like. So that way you can look at practices through that lens is just that last wrinkle, I think. And then that to me seems like a very complete list. Yeah, absolutely. That's like going to a car dealership and just being like, what's a good car? You know, like you have to know what you what what you need the car for. Like what, what is the vehicle yeah, for? Yeah, they show you an SUV, a sedan, truck. You yeah, know, it's like, what it, which one's the best? No, well, yeah, they're all good <laughs> depending yeah. on your goals. Yeah, exactly. exactly. A- anything over three ops is fine. You know, just depending on your goals, anything under three ops, I don't care what else is going on. I don't like it, (laughs) but that's a personal bias. But at the same time, you know, I think, I think it's a pretty strong. So, so now I have to go out and find somebody that's just killing it with less than three ops and and have them on and to challenge you. Jeez. Don't even, (laughs) I can do it. I can do it. It's a pet peeve of mine at this point. It's not even, of course there's somebody out there killing it with three ops. It's just, you know, it's just everything that I'm not. Yeah. Well, that's just what I want on the show. Um, Okay, so I have another question come in that I've actually seen a good bit, and it was something that kind of threw me kind of early on before um, I got involved with shared practices, and I I actually got kind of spoiled. So I got really excited about potentially evaluating practices, Um, Mm -hmm. just getting in some reps on like, you know, fake practices or whatever, where it would come from, looking through financials, learning to interpret them and stuff. But I was just kind of at a loss as to how I would go about getting them. And, and what this question says is, um, I've tried to look up on uh, P&Ls from broker websites for practices, um, but I'm oftentimes, uh, oftentimes finding that they're not listed. Um, I have a hard time hearing back from the brokers. So how, how did you go about initially to, you know, find financials and and get those reps in and, and just get something that you could work with so you could you know have something tangibly to uh to kind of try and you know get your own experience evaluating practices how did you go about that and how could someone go about that if they want so to? i'm curious there's two ways to answer this question there's one that answer the question that you gave me the second one is to question the necessity of that exercise okay so we are two pre-owners, right? So I was a pre-owner and I looked at 400, whatever. And you as a pre-owner looked at, I mean, you probably looked at over a hundred now, right? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So do, do you feel value in that exercise? I mean, we learned a lot. We're nerds. We like it. Yeah. But is that something that you would like, everybody needs to look at at least 20 before they buy one? Is that something that you would give people advice on? No, no. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't think I feel that way either. Yeah. I mean, I I think it is valuable the first... Ooh, it was valuable like the first two or three times I did it. I think yeah. so. Yeah. Um, okay. So how how does someone get their first two or three? What, what's a good resource for uh, for that exercise if people want to do it? If, if they still wanted to do it? Yeah. Well, I mean, we, have, we include two in the ownership accelerator. There so, I mean... Just buy the yeah. ownership accelerator. Right <laughs> I okay. mean, but like, I guess it, it's it's that, just that's the answer to the next ten questions. Actually, so that that really no, I, I don't want that to <laughs> that to turn into this Q and A is plugging stuff. Jeez. Um. So I guess you know the way I did it. So going back to the original question, fine. The way I did it was I offered to help people for free. So you see people posting on Dental Town, 
that are looking at a practice or people posting on Facebook looking for a practice, then private message that person and say, hey, I'm looking to get my hands, you know, I don't know, wet, looking at these practices and I want some help or I want to practice and I'll give you my free thoughts as somebody that has educated myself on this whole process on some things that I feel are valuable in this practice. You're going to get a lot of no's. At least I yeah. did. Which is interesting, right? I'm, I'm messaging somebody to help them for free. And they're like, no thanks. Just suspicious. Uh, yeah, it's just I'm a dental student. Why am I doing this? But yeah. eventually, you know, you've looked at enough and then you get referrals and stuff. But yeah, I guess that would be an easy way to get two or three. That's okay. pretty minimal effort. You know, one thing we could do, and this would be pretty easy to set up, is to just put two or three on our resources page at some point Maybe and just yeah. totally block out the information so it's totally anonymous. And then they can just go because honestly, past three, are you really gaining anything? No, you're just you're like a a bookkeeper. You're just putting like numbers yeah. into Excel sheets and looking at. I think the bigger exercise, and what I would like, and that's that's why I was a little bit annoyed that we spent so much time on valuation in season two. We're teaching you something that you might only need once in your career, with like hours upon hours of content on. When selection is so much more important, right. getting enough opportunities, and being able to have a clear understanding of your vision to me is so much more important than knowing how to value a practice. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Um, you know, I, I think that we were a bit biased being sort of data driven people. Um, mm -hmm. We wanted to understand those numbers and like really get a good look at it. But is it absolutely compulsory if you want to be a successful business owner? Absolutely not. Um, and and I think you're absolutely right about selection. That's something that, you know, we're, we should probably should have focused on a little more. But So the more I look at this, the, I guess, and maybe maybe you're the same way, Tyler, but the more you look at them, the less, I think the more you stop caring about certain information. Does that Absolutely. make sense? Yeah. So yeah. like the p &L, I really don't care about anything other than facility and staff costs. Yeah, that's true. When I look at it, like I've looked at so many, I don't care what they're paying their accountant or their advertising. I'm not going to like, that, that's just, it is what it is. But the things, I think the more I look at them, the more I look towards that production report. And the more I look at patient base size and the exercises, you can, you can pretty much know what you need to know before you look at that, mm -hmm. before you value the practice. Is it have enough patients? Or how many hygienists are there? How many operatories are there? Is it in a good area? What's the curb appeal? There's so many things about the practice that you can tell before you even look at a financial that yeah. I wish more people would focus on that part of it than the, because I guess dentists, you know, we're all very process oriented systematic mm -hmm. people and so we like to okay get spreadsheets put them in evaluate practice spit out number pay that number you know but it's, it's like it can there's there's so much more art to it that i think as you've done this so many times like we both have you realize the art is what stands out not the yeah not the <clears throat> science yeah no, that's fair that's fair okay well that that's enough Talking about evaluations, it, it, it kind of makes me sick sometimes, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I said it because I know I, I've had people personally ask me about it. And, you know, I think it's a question. It's a that. very popular question. Yeah, we get that a lot. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so here, here's another one that's, that's fun. And, and you hear it a good bit. So it says, um, not all GPRs and AGDs are created equally. Uh, some are just like a fifth year out of dental school. Would it be worth it to do a GPR if you found a good one? Um, obviously that's going to come back to vision and, you know, what you're trying to do as a dentist and all that. But, um, I think more generally when people hear about dentists that went into practice straight out of school or very soon thereafter, um, they're, they, they look inwardly and they think about, okay, where am I at right now? Where am I going to be at in a year or two years? Like, can I possibly be clinically competent in order to step into the shoes of a, of a selling dentist and perform dentistry at that level at that pace? Like, how, how do you really evaluate that for yourself? And, and is a residency a remedy to that? Um, so if you could speak to that a little bit, George. I say, this, Sometimes I wonder why people are asking me certain questions. Like, what about, like, my experience with, with like, I have never done a residency. I don't do complex procedures. I, uh, um, so I'm not making fun of whoever asked me this question. I'm more making fun of myself for having such a lack of experience in the area in which the question is being asked. Um, but. I don't know. I personally, for me to do a residency, I'd have to feel like I'm getting a lot. And when yeah. I say a lot, I mean, when I see people do residencies, they walk out diagnostically much further ahead 
than a regular dentist. They yeah. usually can do endo and extractions. So molar endo, extractions, implants, and diagnosis would be like the core four things I'd want out of a residency. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember a conversation we had probably, it was probably a year and a half ago now, um, where I was asking you somewhat of a similar question, but I was more concerned about um, what else I needed to learn in the way of, you know, business and finance and such. And you kind of like stopped me for a moment and you were like, you know, you actually know a lot more than a lot of people do when they get to that stage when they're trying to, you know, get into practice and you would just start with your practice and you were like, what you need to actually start focusing on is learning how to diagnose dentistry and like start actually working on becoming clinically competent. And up until that time, I'd really taken it pretty much for granted that school was going to give me a strong enough foundation um, by necessity, you know, just for me to get a license to be, you know, uh, a dentist. And, and I've had to unlearn that very painfully um, along the way. Um, so, you know, I, I guess, you know, the question is, you know, is there any resources out there that, that you would look to for, for people that are kind of like tossing those sorts of things around their head? Like as far as far as improving their diagnosis, as far as becoming, you know, even even for the bread and butter stuff, like being more competent there and and being able to diagnose more dentistry and and having that sort of clinical suite that exists outside of uh, the confines of a school. Yeah, so I think the diagnosis. When I say that, it's so it it's the thing that threw me the biggest curveball in my. I knew I graduated and I did not think I was like the best endo. GP ever. I did not think I was the best at, you know, doing extractions. I knew I was weak in those two areas. The thing that really surprised me was how unsure of myself I was diagnostically walking into practice. That was the most, and you're sitting in an exam, you're like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. You know, that's a very weird feeling. Yeah. And so the exercise that I did early in my career, which really helped me was I'm going to think of every clinical situation that comes up in my practice, write it down and research and then decide on a way to diagnose that so that I am diagnosing the same every time. Yeah. Regardless of, you know, you pretty much ask any of my hygienists how I diagnose and they'll pretty much tell you, you know, they, they know before I walk into a room if I'm diagnosing something or not. Yeah. Uh, typically, unless, you know, I'm rushed or feeling particularly lazy or, you know, something, I'm usually they can tell, you know, what I'm going to do. And for the most part, you know, that's because I spent time and like, oh, well, why do you treat that? Well, this is why I treat it. This is why I don't. And a lot of times we just treat what our instructors tell us to treat instead of treating what we think is best. And even dentists, a lot of times don't realize how much inconsistency they have in their diagnosis. Right. And that should be a consistent thing. And so opening up your eyes to looking at a mouth and having a process for looking at that mouth and being able to diagnose it. Like you should be able to look at the same mouth 10 different times in 10 different intervals and have the same treatment plan every time. Yeah. That's where you want to get to. That's all. You know, walking out of school. And obviously you're going to add to that. You're going to take CE and you're going to like realize, oh, like maybe, you know, there's certain things that could be done here or there. I'm not going to go into specifics, but you know, you grow your clinical skill set. So I think in general, I would, I would just make a list. It's, it's amazing to me. I do this with coaching clients sometimes when they have inconsistent diagnosis where you make a list of all the things you treat and how you treat them and challenge them to diagnose everything they treat every time. Mm -hmm. And that sounds in, until you're in practice, you don't realize how hard that is. You're like, of course you diagnose everything you treat every time. Why would you never not diagnose something you normally treat? Yeah, that's not real life. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like it's not like we try to miss stuff, but you just miss stuff all the time. And so training yourself to have a process and notice it every time and, and mention it to the patient every time is very challenging. Yeah. But very valuable. I think that's solid. W one thing that I've started doing in school is, you know, anytime I'm I'm looking at a lecture and there's a picture or a radiograph or something, I, I just put myself in the position of, all right, I'm the dentist. This has walked into my office. This is what's in front of me. I've got five minutes to figure out what's the problem. What do I do about it? How do I treat this? And a lot of times I, I find that 
I know a lot less than I figured I would. Like something would look kind of straightforward, but then I kind of start breaking it down in my head. Like, okay, how am I actually going to approach this? And I realize there's there's gaps and things. And it forces me to kind of actually get a little more granular with it and understand like, okay, this is actually how I'm going to approach this. And if I don't know, I need to go, you know, find the answers. So I guess, you know, sort of putting yourself, attempting to put yourself in that seat um, more often and challenging yourself to realize that, you know, these things are going to come through the door one day and you have to, you have to know what you're going to do. Yeah. And there's stuff that, you know, your instructors don't agree on, you know, like treating asymptomatic cracked amalgams. At what point is occlusal carries a carry versus a stain? You know, yeah. at what point on a bite wing are you treating an incipient cavity? You know, all of these things are subjective decisions that we make in dentistry every day. And politically making a stand on where you are on that spectrum and why you treat what you treat and doing it that way every time is. And then also, you know, opening up your eyes. I mean, I haven't done a whole lot of spear, panky, coy stuff, mm -hmm. but everybody that does that stuff talks about how when they do it, they just see things differently see. and more than, and that's the thing that I think residencies give you because every time I look at somebody who has done a residency, the cases they present to people, the treatment plan sizes, you know, on practice by numbers are just so much larger. Yeah. And so they're seeing stuff I'm not seeing in people's mouths. And it's not that it's wrong or it's not there. It's just that they have more training than I do. And so right. to me that I would want to go to a residency where I'm getting that. And I yeah. don't know what that is or how to know if I'm getting it, but I would want that. Yeah. I'm going to go to residency. Yeah, that's fair. And and how much freedom do you feel you have currently to sort of expand your clinically palate, your clinical palate currently, you know, with all the things that all the moving parts that you have currently, like if you wanted to go do some spear courses or whatever it is, do you feel like you have as much more or less freedom than you used to when you were in school to do that? More. I mean, if I wanted to, that's the big thing. And yeah. I'm not saying I don't want to get better. I'm just saying that like I took implant pathways, right, which is 72 credit hours of CE last year. So like I'm kind of tapped out for a bit. I don't feel like taking on a big thing, you know, but I kind of like to take on, you know, a big procedure or something like that that I'm adding to my practice as opposed to just going to learn about random stuff and hopefully through osmosis it makes me better. But, mm -hmm. you know, in general – yeah, I think as a practice owner, it's a lot easier to grow that. But as a dental student, I'd imagine if – the problem is there's different things about dentistry that interest different people. And you're naturally going to be strong in the areas where you gravitate, where your interests are. My interests are in the practice management space, the leadership space, the patient communication space. Those are areas that interest me. The full mouth rehab, smile design, you know, that stuff does not interest me really in the slightest. And so the idea of taking CE on those areas is just repulsive, really. And so I'm just not going to do it, you know? So it's not like because I'm a practice owner, I can't do that. It's just because I have no interest right. in that. Do I not want to, you okay. know? And th that's, that's more the reason. Okay. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, l a little more lazy Dennis philosophy nuggets there for us. Yeah, you know, just like I, uh, <laughs> like my mom, uh, she's a dentist and yep. she's a big, big spear education person. She went to all their stuff, study club leader, and she just totally embraces me and my dentist ways. And, you know, she's like, yeah, you know, she, she's like, she'll talk to you about stuff I'm like, yeah, I just don't really want to learn about that. You know, not interested. <laughs> I mean, I like, I like simpleton dentistry. Like it just, yeah. to me, it makes dentistry less stressful. It makes the relationship with the patient more enjoyable because it's, it's, that's what the focus is. The focus is on having the patient have a great experience and our simpleton dentistry, single tooth, you know, quadrant dentistry. It's really what we're doing. Nothing crazy. You know, we're not changing people's lives. We're just fixing their teeth, you yeah. know? Um, yeah, that's kind of where I like to be. But again, like, different different strokes for different folks whatever you want to call it but you know everyone has their own preferences it's just mine is not that you know that type of dentistry okay that's fair yeah uh <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. I'm totally gonna get roasted by somebody for this you are i'm just i'm just thinking in the back of my head about man george is in in for it now i'm not gonna give it to you now personally i can't you know but uh, yeah i mean this is dentists are very different than me in a lot of ways you know so yeah yeah so this no, I like it. Just just keep putting yourself out there on the chopping block. I like it. <laughs> so um, the next question, and this is actually a pretty good one. So um, not that the other ones were bad, but what resources are out there to help us understand insurance better? 
Um, should I pursue FFS or go straight for PPO? So this is something that I, you know, personally, I've had a little bit of confusion with is, you know, there's no insurance 101 class in dental school. So FFS is fee for service for anybody that's, so yeah. the person is asking what practice model they should pursue and how to learn about insurance. Yeah. And, and that's, that's a topic that you could go into, you know, for many, many long hours with many different people and get, you know, every different kind of opinion. Because I mean, some people act like, you know, FFS is, um, you know, the salvation for dentistry. George feels very differently. Um, yes. But, you know, maybe speak to that a little bit and and how someone can sort of become a PPO ninja if that's what they wanted to do. You know, how did you go about like learning the basics and understanding how those things actually work? I kind of think that's one of those areas and I could be wrong. But I kind of think that's one of those areas that you learn while owning a practice. Okay. I think it is harder to learn about the... So I guess two things, right? That's a, that's something you would learn in an associateship, I would think. You know, mm-hmm. especially if you're working for like a regional corporate group. Somebody like the big DSOs, you're not going to learn a whole lot about insurance. But there's that regional group, somebody with like 6 to 10 to 12 practices in that middle range where they kind of run them like individual practices. They don't have enough software stuff to hide what they're doing with insurance but okay. they they know what they're doing you know they co- the way they code things the cdt the the usage of the cdt codes the uh that you learn a lot in those environments i i inter- i interview i don't interview but I, I ask my friends you know how you guys code certain things here and there and mm-hmm. people that work at different places they code them differently and it's interesting to me you know i don't always take what i hear because sometimes i don't agree with the ethics behind it but it's just interesting to hear how stuff is done. And so as an associate, I would try to learn that stuff. Why am I coding things a specific way? Why am I using this code versus that code? And as an owner, start understanding your your AR and that stuff. I mean, I can't imagine as an associate walking up to the office manager, like, can you tell me about our overdue collections? You're like, what are we doing there? Like, they're like why are you asking? <laughs> like, that's such an irrelevant question to your job, you know? So, yeah. um I, I'm, I'd imagine there are courses on insurance, but I also, you know, there are still things with insurance that I don't know how to do. And I don't think we have to know everything. Okay. I think we have to know how to manage the process. Okay. And yeah. when something breaks down, that's <clears throat> when you roll your sleeves up and you get involved. You know, like insurance verification is an area that I know a lot about because that's an area that I had to do a lot of work on in my practice. But, you know, sending claims is kind of a very basic thing and I don't know how to do that because they've always known how to send claims. So it, it hasn't been an area that we had to work on. And yeah. so I do not know how to send a claim. So you don't you don't feel that you need to know how to do everyone in your practice's job in order to tell them how to do it? No. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think that would be an unrealistic expectation of me. Okay. I need to know how to make sure that everyone is doing their job. So right. like I can tell if claims are not being sent properly based on, you know, my analytics, but I don't care how to send a claim okay okay that's all but now i i do want to touch on the different practice models you use the word ffs i call it fee for service so it i mean i think solos really get to have a choice you know if i'm going to be a solo dentist and work by myself yeah i can choose fee for service or or the ppo model and if you're going to be in a multiple dentist practice and your goal is to build a business, I do feel strongly that it's a lot simpler when you have something of, you have a retention that is not related to you, which a lot of times is the in the subscription of dental insurance. So that's my personal philosophies. I love PPOs. I don't take a ton of them. I think I take like 10. So I don't call that a ton. I mean, maybe that's a ton. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Um, but we take 10 insurances or so and i love i love the model it has its downsides right we get the denials we get the crap that everyone else gets but you ultimately the benefits it gives you are to my in my mind immense and i i'm in love with dental insurance so yeah i have no intention of going fee for service i think that's a really um can i just like go totally biased for like two minutes no, please, because I mean, you're just digging yourself such a deep hole, and I'm I'm just loving to sit here and watch it. It's great. Yeah, I, I, at this point, I don't care. I'm, you know, I'm in love with haters. Don't hate. I I have haters out there, and I can't tactic. believe that I do. And it is what it is. But um, who would have thought? I, but, I don't. I don't change lives. I fix teeth, and I'm in love with dental insurance. That's going to be the summary of this whole episode. Jeez. <laughs> 
gosh, you know, it's funny because I forget a lot of the stuff I say on the show. I just sort of talk. I don't. I don't. And do you remember everything you say? <laughs> I remember everything you say. I don't know what I say. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Nobody remembers what they say. You're just talking. So yeah, anyway, like, this whole fee for service crap, it really, you know, it, it annoys me because the, everybody that pushes fee for service hard pushes these membership plans. So if you are, ask, yeah, you know, yeah. so it's like if you're pushing fee for service, they're pretty much everybody and their grandma is trying to sell you a subscription service to have you know all your fee for service patients on this membership plan. So you're pretty much having your in house insurance. Right, and I have the in-house insurance thing, because the reality is they're right. You know, it it is necessary for like dental insurance patients have great retention because you take their insurance and it's free, and they come back for free and all that stuff. Patients that don't have insurance, you know, obviously the best type of practice would be if you had a bunch of patients, nobody had insurance, and they all paid using their credit card, you know, or even better check because then you don't pay the three percent merchant fee, you know. But the reality is that's not real life. So they, they have these membership plans and my revenue per patient on a membership plan is my worst dental insurance in my office. I see. I, I just, I can't understand it because I, I just, I can't get my mind around that. And we charge a lot for our membership plan. It's not like we're pretty cheap. You know, we're 350 for the first year mm-hmm. for their two cleanings and the dis- discount and all services. Right. So I'm having a hard time wrapping my mind around why I should be in love with that idea of building a practice where I am the dental insurance carrier and Mm. I am giving dental insurance to all my patients and they're buying insurance for me and dentistry for me. And this is this great model where I'm not dependent on any third party company. But meanwhile, my revenue per patient is much less and my patient retention, they have to pay for that. It's not like it's included in their employment. So I'm 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 very I'm I'm very confused behind this whole desire for cash patients. You have the lowest case acceptance. You have the lowest revenue per patient. It's the biggest uphill battle. Uh, to me, it's just people that don't do dental insurance well. If, rather than being able to learn to do dental insurance well, you're just gonna try something different. Um, but you know, we we do insurance well, and so those patients to me are. I mean, it's just my way of keeping my cash patients happy. Uh, but it's not. I don't view it as a practice changer or a grower or anything. And no offense to anybody that sells those products. I I just don't see any substantial value. There's minor value. I think it's like a nice flavor in your practice. It's like mm-hmm. we do care credit. It's To me, it's as significant as care credit. We okay. offer care credit. We offer proceed finance. I don't even think about them. They're just yeah. there. I don't even think about the membership plan. It just is there. It gets offered. I don't even know how many patients I have on it. I really don't care. It's mm-hmm. not going to change my life. Um, I... Th- I th- yeah, it, the whole thing to me is just really uh, overblown, and it just is picking at dentists like pain points of not not like dental insurance. Since it's a great great way to sell product, but it, it reality is it's not going to transform your practice. This practice, like eighty percent of your patients are on that plan, sounds horrible to me. Yeah, well, to be fair, not everyone is in love with dental insurance and and figures themselves to be gurus of insurance verification, et cetera. So I don't consider myself to be a guru of insurance. Verification. You use that word. I didn't. I, I learned about the process a lot. And, okay. but you know, it just, yeah, it, I guess for me, it, it sometimes things bother me when mm-hmm. in general, and this could, I'm going to piss off people one last time. Any basketball fans out there, the whole MJ LeBron debate pisses me off. <laughs> <laughs> because analytically speaking, it's not even close. It's not even a debate. It shouldn't even be discussed. LeBron is the best basketball player that's ever played, and it's not even remarkably close. It Man. that was it's a far second. Man. And you talk to people with emotions and opinions, and they're like, ah, that's like that idea is totally blasphemous. Same thing with dental insurance. I think when you look at numbers and you look at the way it actually is, it's very clear that that membership plan idea isn't as fantastic as it's pitched. But when you include emotions and pain points and all that stuff, it all of a sudden becomes much more attractive. And so um, that to me is sort of, man, I, I did not expect to to ruffle so many feathers this episode. Yeah. Um, but, you know, that, that, was, that was funny. Uh- <laughs> yeah. I, I've impressed myself just by being able to draw that much out of you. I, I, I credit myself with it. Yeah, uh, I know. You ask me questions and you ask for honest opinions and that's what you're yeah, going to get. I, I didn't know that we were going to come into the MJ versus LeBron. 
Yeah, I'm so happy I got to put that out on air. You know, I, any basketball fans out there, you know, email me about that one. I'll respond. <laughs> <laughs> that is a topic I'm passionate about. It really drives me nuts. The fact that, you know, anyway. Yeah. Besides, that, that might be an episode in and of itself, actually. Jeez. <laughs> do wow. we have anything else for this one? Or do you want to just uh, probably need to do another Q&A? To yeah, no, I, I think we, we probably have, um, you know, more for another episode. I don't think we need to tag it on to this one, so. Yeah. Cool. I hope you guys enjoyed the segment. And you know, these are very commonly received questions. So I think the idea is that these episodes should be able to flesh them out. So um, anyway, right. hopefully you guys enjoyed this. We'll see you guys next week on the Pursuit of Ownership. Thanks, everybody. Had to get the last word on your own show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting, I'm getting a little possessive of my baby. I know. I can see that. We're we're including this in the recording, by the way. John, don't edit this out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm gonna go.